What's up, everybody? It's Soren Baker here on Unique Access Entertainment. As always, please hit that subscribe button. It's right down there and it's free. That enables us to keep coming to you guys as often as possible with as many interviews as possible. So please hit that subscribe button. Tell a friend. Each one, teach one. We appreciate you guys' support getting us this far. And of course, get it us on Cash App if you're so inclined. Unique Access ENT. Now, today we have the honor and the privilege of being joined by somebody I've been admiring and met a couple of times in passing over the years. Very excited today for DJ Tad Money. Thank you for coming through, sir. My brother Soren. Pleasure. My pleasure is all mine, brother. Yes. Well, thank you. Thank you. So, uh, so much to talk about because you got so many uh, accolades in your career, different crews, all kinds of stuff. And of course, doing stuff with the alumni now with Dana mm -hmm. Dane, Chub Rock, Kwame Special Ed, and Moni Love traveling around the country, doing a lot of great shows with them. But Yes, sir. Let's take it all the way back because I think I figured this out much longer into your career at, uh, after not understanding. I was like, man, how did he get this Tad Money name? What is Tad Money? And isn't that just your initials? <laughs> yeah, it's my initials. So I used, to, I used to be a graffiti writer too. So I would write, you know, my Tat, T-A-T in the bathroom. So I'd be like, raise my hand in the classroom, like, can I go to the bathroom? You sure. And I bring my marker with me and I'm like, yeah, I, I hit up the bathroom real quick, you know, nice, fresh Sharpie or whatever. And um, I go back in my seat. Somebody would go to the bathroom and they'd be like, yo, I saw you hit up the bathroom. Oh my God. I'd be like, because, you know, cats with no T-A-T. And um, that's kind of where it started. So basically that was, that was the whole thing. That was eighties. You know what I mean? So I was breakdancing, beatboxing, DJing, rhyming, graffiti. The science behind it was really DMC, Daryl McDaniels. So it was like, you know, Terrence Thomas, Terrence Allen Thomas is my real name. So I just I just took the TAT and just said, all right, Tat. And money was like a big thing, you know. It was like, my name is Rob Money or, you know, my name is Mark Money or, you know, Frank Ski, you know, Ski was big too, but I wasn't big on the Ski part, but the money was a lot because I, I like money. Everybody likes money. So I was like, tap money. I was like, all right, tap money. I was like, all right, that's, that's kind of cool. I, I could rock with that for a minute. Yeah, and Philly with code money, cash money, tap money. There were all the, the great Philly DJs with the name too, so. Yeah, at that time, I didn't know anyone with it. I just liked it, you know, on the, the graph side. And then what, en what ended up happening is I started to do like, pause tapes my mother had this component set and um you know the, the turntable is not like these but like the turntable was on, on it was on stock the stacked up on a uh like a little like piece of furniture type hookup and it's got the receiver and it's got the tape deck in the middle you know this you know the kind and the record spot for the record at the bottom so like a straight up and down joint and i would do the pause tapes on them and i'd be rocking you know super rapping bang 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 hit it bang 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 hit it pause bang 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 hit it pause and then the tape would come out fly and then I brought it to school and let some cats hear it. And it was like DJ Tat. And I was like, yo, that sounds kind of dope. DJ Tat, DJ Tat, DJ Tat, uh, DJ Tat money. I was like, I, I just rocked with it. You know, it was, it just kind of flowed or whatever. So that was kind of how it evolved. And then as, I said, I, I go ahead. Well, as you were progressing, what did you find that you got out of DJing more than, even though you kept rhyming, over the years a little bit, but what did you find you got more out of DJing than say graffiti or b-boying or rhyming? Mm, I would to say the least, because graffiti gets you locked up. You know what I mean? Somebody, <laughs> so, and I, I'm no criminal. So I was like, look, I ain't trying to, you know, have this old, yeah, you know, I got this felony tag, woo, woo, woo. I, that's not my vibe at all. My parents would have, uh, kicked my back in so I was like nah 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 we ain't we ain't my pop is Jamaican you gotta be kidding me he would be get out of here with that craziness what is you doing so I that rearing that good rearing you know I couldn't let them down so I had to lay away from that b-boying is my thing break dancing popping that's my that was my thing so but the DJing it just as Dana would say full circle it just <laughs> it just brings it Right around because you, you, you're in control of the music. And I think, not think, I know, I used to DJ my my parents' parties. Like they would have parties at the house and I'd be like six or seven. And I would just grab like the 45s, stack them up. 
you know, on their 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 uh, big ass freaking you know turntable slash furniture unit that they had in the house. It was a big joint that was long from here to there, and the turntable was in the in the front of it. And uh, you slide the top and you put the records in. So I was the DJ for the party. And then I would get out there and dance, me and my cousin. So I put the records on that, you know, James Brown and, you know, Earth, Wind & Fire, you know, all the all the hype fly stuff that I wanted to listen to and, and dance to. That was quick. Get on the good foot, you know, all that kind of stuff. And that was really what sparked me to start DJing. I just told my dad this story the other day. He didn't even understand it. But we had so many records in that freaking coffin that i called it you know the turntable i mean the, the turntable was in it and it had like a it was big as hell you know it took up all this space i you know people sat on it i had to clean it i used to get my allowance from cleaning it with furniture polish pledge <laughs> i get my little two three dollars and then go to the store and buy records so yeah history and we had a ton of records inside that thing all diana ross and this one and that one there's a bunch of different people my people my, my, my parents bought so i mean a wide range of music from the carpenters to barry manilow you name it we had everything and then again my dad is jamaican so we had a lot of reggae and you talking about the 70s so i was introduced to it mad early before it was even popular in the states that's crazy okay yeah yeah before it was before people was into it, before they was kind of like, ah, what is that? Ah. And I'm like, hmm, okay, you catch on sooner or later. Europe was into it. And then all of a sudden, Stevie Wonder went to Jamaica, did a concert with Bob Marley, and um, it started to blow. It started to hit like, you know, uh, Urban AC radio. And then it just took off from there. And I witnessed all of that, like, wow, look at this. And my pop had the A tracks in the car playing them joints. That's crazy. Most fly. Yeah, so that was my musical intro <laughs> background. So as, as you were growing as a DJ, getting more into stuff, uh, doing writing and doing different things, how did you find that all this diverse music helped you kind of know what to do or what to look for musically, creatively? Uh, I mean, again, I listen to everything, rock, reggae, you name it um pop soul r&b rap whatever i listened to a, a lot of it prior to rap but it was just a conglomerate of it all and it just it actually just helped me you know be more flexible to be able to pretty much go by the feeling because that's what i usually do when i'm doing a party or something you gotta like most djs would say you gotta fill the crowd you gotta like sense what's going on with them because that one wrong record and they they go and they they, they hitting the skids so you just got to watch their vibe and be like, all right, I see where they at. And then boom, hit them with this, hit them with that, you know? So it just, it just makes you well-rounded, I would say, more well-rounded than anything, than just listening to X music, you know what I mean? Being as I'm listening to a lot of different like slow jams, you name it. I mean, I love all music. So it's not just hip-hop. Right. Know, hip-hop DJ, okay, yeah, good, but I can play everything house you name it i can play it all i mean because i feel it you know what i mean okay. so it's it gives you a good advantage so that makes sense now when i first was learning about who you are was uh the early stuff with steady b but i also knew uh before you there was the grand dragon kd that was doing the scratches mm -hmm. and all the stuff when it was on pop right. before he got to jive so right. that was the Yo Mother Just Calls Def Take Your Radio era. So when those, when those songs were coming out, had you met uh, Steady B in the Hilltop Dudes yet or not yet? Or what was happening with you? No, nah, at that time, um, I was really, you know, cutting my teeth trying to get in the game, basically, because Philly, you know, we had here and there, you know, record company or whatnot, you know, this one, that one. It wasn't a whole lot going on. Um, or you just had to get in with them, you know what I mean? Unlike New York, where you had a bunch, I mean, I'm not going to say it was any easier because, you know, back then it was a lot harder to get, you know, prove yourself and get there, you know, get to a studio and all that kind of stuff. It was a lot harder. But so the Philly vibe um, basically was either you getting through through a party or you're going to make an independent record, but who had money to make an independent record at that time? You know, you'd have to have connections to get the studio and the know-how and all of these things. So 
what I ended up doing was um, it's funny too because I just talked to a friend of mine that used to work here. I I got a job at um, a local record store downtown. It's called Funko Mart. A lot of people ask me about it. They're like, "Oh man, you used to work at Funko Mart." It was a it was underground, so the, the store was like it was on Market Street, but it went down under the ground. You know what I mean? So you you went in and you went downstairs and this this classic man that was just iconic because people came in and it was like yo like we in the bait this is dope look at this it was fly and i worked there for like a couple of years or what have you but i think i started when i was 17 and um my goal was to figure out the industry because there was no internet there was no phones and you had books i would check the books out but i didn't know how accurate the books are you know made men and this business of music is big ass freaking telephone thicker than a telephone book book. You know what I mean? It was crazy. So I had the book, but it was like, is this real? Like, is this, so you had no guidelines. So basically I just said, you know, I'm gonna get a job at this record store. Since everybody comes here to buy records, I'm getting a job here. And then I'm gonna figure it out from the retail standpoint. I heard Mantronics did that. That was another thought I was reading in the magazine that he, he got a job at, record store so i was like hmm, i'm gonna try the same thing and it worked i got down there and um i learned a lot about retail and how and when and where stuff sells and who's buying what and that was kind of cool um at, at a very good time in music music was pumping hot you know what i mean was latino music was pumping i learned a lot about all these different types of music jazz and you know being in the record store and people coming in from their requests like oh i want the new need I need a Baker record because her first record was a jazz record, and we used to sell that. But then she made an R and B record, and that was you know the rapture, and it was just like that was like, and that's the Grammys and all that. Just when it took off, and I was just like, yo, look at that evolution. That was sick the way that happened. The same with Janet Jackson, Bobby Brown. You know their first albums were, meh. and then there was Control, bam, and then there was, you know, My Prerogative, <laughs> you know. Hmm. So to answer questions as far as the steady part, um, I was making like tapes and whatnot still because I was just honing my craft, getting the, you know new records and learning them and you know cutting them up and you know doing my thing with them and making my tapes. So I put the tapes out there, and a mutual friend of of steady and, and mine told him about me, and that's when he came looking for me, and he heard I worked at Funko Mart. Came right down the steps. I saw him. I was just like, he came down with one of his first DJs. Um, his name was uh, Hank. I think it was like Grandmaster Tank. His name was Tank. As a matter of fact, he was a big guy. I said Hank. <laughs> his name was Tank. And he was built like a tank. He was a big dude. So he came down. I was like, steady B. All right, all right. You know, okay, cool. I figured he's coming down there to buy some records. It's a big ass place. You know, records everywhere, There's aisles of records all over. He walked down the steps and came directly over to me. And I was like, so he was like, you tech? Da, 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 da. He was like, listen, I'm looking for a DJ. And, you know, I'm trying to see, you know, if you interested and this, that, and the third. And I was just like, wow, this is right out of a movie. This is crazy. Like, crazy. <laughs> so that's how, that's how it ended up happening. Okay. And you guys clearly worked together for several years uh, with Steady B, with uh, Cool C, and Three Times Dope uh, for a while. So what made you and Steady B get along so well? Uh, it was just a, a cool situation. I mean, I didn't know him prior to that. He was a few years younger than me. So we just basically had common uh, goals and our goals was, you know, to make hot records. So he was like, yo, he respected me as a DJ, which is, is crucial, especially when you're making albums and whatnot. And that respect was like at, from the door, he was like, bam, you know, when I auditioned quote unquote for the manager, he was like, see, I told you he was dope. And I was just like, Oh, thank you. Like that, that goes a long way. So, and I dug him, you know, as an MC. So I was just like, and I like, I dug that hardcore edge, you know what I mean? So I was like, all right. I was like, yo, this is, this is a, a match made in heaven. That was pretty fly. So that, that's really 
how like and, you know we just had that commonality of we're trying to like we're trying to blow this game up we're trying to get in this game and make our mark that was really what it was all about so that's all we talked about like oh man and of course you know making hot records it's not just oh we're trying to make our mark we want to make a some dope ass record so cats will be like 10 20 30 years later like yo that shit was fat be sure to check out the history of gangster rap by soren baker he's official history of gangster rap features exclusive interviews with ice t snoop dogg mc ren the doc and dozens of others the history of gangster rap a definitive look at how los angeles changed rap forever in los angeles the streets definitely set the tone of the hip hop music. I'm 19, I got a $50,000 car. My whole angle always was I'll be street, but I will always tell you the horrors that go along with this life. It will be penalties and casualties for just wearing the wrong color in somebody's neighborhood. And once gangster rap made it from the streets to the TV, the genre exploded. What's that, Bob, on your TV basketball? Yo MTV it just catapulted us from being local heroes to national gangbang rappers. The history of gangster rap discusses it all from 1980 up till today. There's always gonna be shit happening in the streets. You know what I mean? So it's always going to be something to talk about. The history of gangster rap in stores now.